One of the most exciting aspects of the Falcarius find is its sheer numbers. The majority of dinosaurs are known on the basis of one partial skeleton or even just a few bones. Dozens of partial Falcarius skeletons have already been collected and the site promises to yield hundreds, if not thousands more. Right to the side of me, we pulled out 400 bones in a cubic meter. That's a space about three foot by three foot by three foot. And that's a remarkable density of bones. This graveyard contains many well-preserved fossils in huge numbers. But to see how each piece fits together, it's necessary to look at the known relatives of the newly discovered Falcarius. Its head is most like its meat-eating cousins. This is the skull of Velociraptor from Mongolia. It's probably the best preserved skull ever recovered. Even the sclerotic rings, the bones around the eye are in place within the orbit. And as with other Manoraptorans, we see the plumage that these animals might have had in life and the feather, fur-like feathers coming down its neck. The Mongolian desert buried some dinosaurs alive. Sandstorms preserve several Oviraptors in their entirety. This provides a wonderful blueprint, as Oviraptor is the closest relative to Falcarius. Here is a wonderfully articulated Oviraptor. The Oviraptors are the closest relatives to the Therizinosaurs. They share a common ancestor. Falcarius is the oldest, most primitive type of Therizinosaur we have. If you look at the front, the chest area, we can see that the chest is built in a very similar way. We can see the hands, the Manoraptoran hands are similar. See the shorter upper thigh bone or femur, longer lower bone or tibia fibula. This is more of a running, agile type of animal. And as we mentioned, these animals have shorter tails. Unlike the Therizinosaurs, these animals are completely toothless. These may have been plant eaters as well. Finding animals that are perfectly articulated, that have been buried alive as we find them in Mongolia, are critical for accurately reconstructing the skeletons of animals like Falcarius that have all fallen apart or disarticulated. Guided by these complete skeletons, Rod Gaston reconstructed Falcarius. His challenge was to take a pile of bones no one had ever seen before and try to figure out how they all fit together. When we start a skeletal reconstruction, the first thing that we do is take the original fossil, which has been cleaned and prepared in a lab, and we make a research cast, which is just a, an accurate cast of the original fossil. And before we cast them, we need to make sure that they're stabilized for casting, which often means filling cracks with carbo wax. Uh, and also, we need to make sure that the bone has been properly consolidated with glue. No reconstruction work is done on the original fossil. We take the research cast. We restore the areas that are missing. You can see clearly this big chunk out of this ilium and when you look at the pelvis after it's been reconstructed what we've attempted to do is restore those areas. Consulting with paleontologists, um, using comparative literature, casts, things of that nature from animals that are more complete. We then try and get an idea of what those missing areas look like. You can see that Andrew is doing that same process on this cast of a Tarbosaur skull where he's applying epoxy putty to the missing areas. Before this restoration can take place, the bones must be cast. The first step in creating a mold is building a clay wall around half the piece. Then it's time to add rubber. We uh, use a silicone rubber to make the molds with, but probably the most important thing with silicone rubber is that it does not adhere to the fossil when you take the fossil out of the mold, so therefore you don't get as much breakage or damage to the original piece. After that's done, we then apply a resin, what's known as a backup mold or a mother mold over that, and then we flip the piece over, pull out the modeling clay, We'll repeat the process again. So if everything's been done properly, we're able to pull the two rubber halves apart, pull the original bone out of the rubber, and then we end up with essentially our mold, and we're ready for casting. To make the casts, a plastic resin is poured into the molds. Mixing two parts of the resin together activates a chemical reaction, which makes it harden. Filler and color are added to make the resulting cast lighter weight and the desired color. Now once it's full, we'll 
turn it and get all the air bubbles up to the top of it. Once the resin has hardened, the plastic cast is carefully removed from the mold and placed in the sand to keep its shape as it cools. After the uh, casts are pulled out of the molds, they're cleaned, and we begin the assembly process, which on smaller things basically just amounts to drilling and pinning the pieces in, and then we use super glue, things like that, to hold them together, sometimes epoxies. Um, the larger pieces, however, require some pre-engineering where we do incorporate steel into the pieces. This steel is important in assembling the long neck and tail of Falcarius and for its legs to be able to support this weight. That enables us to weld the pieces together, providing a strong structure to put the skeleton together. At this stage, it gets really exciting because no matter how many months you've spent with the skeletal material, making the molds, the casts, the reconstructions, the skeleton always comes out a little bit different than what you think it's going to. Um, so here we go. Uh, Andrew, you want to give me a hand putting this together? One thing that's really interesting, too, about putting Falcarius together, or any partially known skeleton for that matter, is that there's things that we may never know about this animal. So no matter how much research has been done on reconstructing it, we may never know whether what we've done is correct or not. So there we go. A clearer picture of Falcarius and his environment has emerged through the efforts of Kirkland's crew. With the huge number of bones still in the graveyard, they hope many more questions will be answered. The Crystal Geyser Quarry, which preserves hundreds of individuals of Falcarius, is really unique and rare in the fossil record. And it's supremely important because when we have all these bones, you'll notice that we have babies, we have juveniles, and we have adults. We have hundreds of elements to make comparisons across. We're able to tell about Falcarius, how fast it grew, what uh, age it was when it reached sexual maturity, uh, if there are differences between males and females, how much variation there was in the population. These are things that we rarely get to access from the fossil record. And as a result, we're able to reconstruct the ecology and the life history of a species of dinosaur that's been extinct for over 125 million years. That's nothing short of incredible. The amazing wealth of material at the Crystal Geyser Dinosaur Quarry means that scientists may eventually know more about Falcarius utahensis than just about any other known dinosaur. It's remarkable. Every other specimen is a partial skeleton. Here we have hundreds of animals, babies to adults, all in the same locality, probably killed at the same time. Uh, it gives us a re remarkable opportunity to study this animal. Was Falcarius the first Therizinosaur? Did they evolve in Utah? were in China. Why did they become plant eaters? What attracted this strange animal to this site? What killed them off in vast numbers? Perhaps we will never know the answers to all these questions. Buried in the Utah Dino Graveyard at Crystal Geyser Quarry are still many clues. Each summer, our paleo detectives will be searching for more answers, and every year, a more complete and complex picture of Falcarius and the land that it inhabited will emerge.